real act of faith in the beginning to think that this muddy patch of ground would actually become the home that you'd hoped for. Hi, my name's Errol. I joined the scheme in November. Um, looking to build a two-bed house here. It was definitely a sense of pride about being part of something bigger than yourself. And I like the idea of living with a bunch of black people as well. It was a good feeling to know that it was all black people doing it. There are tensions sometimes, but we all stick together. <laughs> Another night in security. This is my usual night, me and Errol. Bye. When I first came here, I didn't know we had to do security. I thought, what are you talking about? With, I'm going to be on Thursday on my own. We actually built it from nothing. If you look at what black men and women have done here, you will see that you can do all sorts of extraordinary things. So it really was resisting. post-war experience of Caribbean migrants was overwhelmingly a negative one in, in too many respects. Having access to housing was always a huge problem. Council housing brought their own difficulties for uh, black people. There was a sense that the real tenants were the people who were the locals, whereas the immigrants were people who were, in a way, intruding. I think this was exacerbated by the council, particularly if it's dominated by white councillors, refusing to acknowledge the role of racism. Lewisham, like many other areas, has suffered from the process in which people are put second to economic forces. The rundown of employment, coupled with the disasters of high density estates, all make fertile ground for racism, fascism, and the National Front. We have thought about building things for ourselves and, and defining what it is that we want out of life in Britain. And house building is a particularly clear example of making real what it is we can achieve despite the odds. Congratulations to Fusion to Jermaine, to the first black self-build in London. Congratulations to your courage in actually taking on this high-risk thing of building a house. And I fully support and congratulate you on doing that. And if you'll excuse my pronunciation, big things are gone. <laughs> but with your help, bigger things are gone. <laughs> It was probably about 1994 that I heard about Nubia Way and uh, Fusion Jameen. And I did some research, found out about Jose Espina, who was developing a self built for rent model. Experience in self built came mainly from my work in, in Colombia. I saw in practice the work that uh, communities, organised communities, could do in terms of contributing towards their own housing. So this is the model that we rolled out initially with Fusion Shemin Housing Corp, an Afro-Caribbean cooperative formed in the north of Lewisham. The local authority was quite willing to offer sites from their land bank. The Downham Estate was a huge cottage estate built by the London County Council in the late 1920s. The site where Nubia Way was created was a rather undefined area. It was really difficult to see how else you'd get any sort of housing. The lure of building your own place was really strong. Why would anybody want to do self-build? So you're giving your free labour for two years. You get three things from the reward. You get subsidised rent, uh, lower than the normal social rent. So you get 30% of that for the whole of the tenancy. A second time, you get a lump sum 
and the point that you leave the tenancy. The third reward is that if you stay in the house, which most of us are, do and are very happy, then your children can inherit the discounted rent one time. Everyone had to build together, so we started at number 13 and we would work our way down. The first day I came here, I couldn't really see, visualise what this could become, you know. There's going to be a lot of work. I'd never come across anything like that before, that, that organised, that ambitious. It's just like a jigsaw. Every section has a section and you tie the section in. And then basically the joists, your roof rafters, etc. that ties the whole of the house in. All I'm doing right now, as I say, is just setting out so that we keep the frames nice and straight, OK, and square initially, rather than having to guess it. It's all set out for us. It just makes life easier. Walter Siegel was the architect that proposed self-build, and he said, we've got to design houses in such a way that the tenants can assemble them. The Siegel system is about posts and beams. I, they are just timber frames that are bolted together on the ground and then lifted in place. The frames are raised up. And then we add all the joists, um, all the walls, the stud partitions, the roof, etc. Lewisham had a lot of sites which were very difficult to build on conventionally with conventional brick or concrete. And the great advantage of Walter Siegel's buildings, of course, is they're very lightweight. They can float on sites that are otherwise difficult to build on. Walter's original buildings were very simple, very cheap, but not very well insulated. At Archetype, we did a number of these carp schemes and it became clear that as you increase the performance of the building it becomes less and less economic to use that post and beam structure. The thing about the design of the houses is the, the basic outer shell is kind of standard but as you go in the houses you realise things have been done differently. I've always got this phrase you know just sue me you know. <laughs> The architect came along one day and he said, where's the window for the den? And I said, what window? It's a special place, very special place. Because you can look, you can be outside and look up and you can remember nailing that bit up and you can remember sawing those bits there and all sorts of things, you know. Building itself was hard, but not harsh. It was actually a, a very spiritual thing to do, I found, because you, you cut a bit of wood, it's going to be a, the, you know, the main beam in the middle of your house or something. And, you know, you can smell it. It's got a smell to it. And some of the stuff we used here, cherry oak, when you cut it, it smells of cherries. So you kind of got a real kind of intimate connection with building these houses. There was acres of mud on the front and the back. And you'd come in in the morning and you needed a certain tool. And you'd ask a few people, have you seen where of so and so? And they say, oh, down at 13. So you trudge down to 13. And when you get to there, oh, they've come up to number one now. So you trundle back to number one, and they say you've gone to number four now, and this could go on for some time <laughs> before you found the things you needed. Your boots would end up with kilos of cloy mud, you know, on them. Right, I'm going to be going soon, you know. When my kids came on the site, um, I remember one time Kieran came on his own. He just loved it to see what Dad's doing. They loved coming down here with their dad. A couple of times they had their little hard hats. <laughs> and they'd be running up and down. There were days going back to self-build where we were frame lifting and a whole load of people from another project would come up and help us. It's an amazing feeling to sort of have these frames sitting on the floor and two hours later there's the shape of the house. <laughs> That's a seminal moment, you know, <laughs> really, you know, magnificent sort of days. They were really, really, really good days. OK, yeah, this is my house and uh, it's getting on really well now. How come the um, red lights come back on again? You must have put, what was it? We used to have to work 25 hours a week on site, and then we did an extra 16 hours security. When the scheme was started, there weren't enough people. We hadn't recruited a full group. We went down to six people for a long while. I think it was about a year. When we started, I would think two thirds of us were working. Two years in, I don't think anybody was. They just couldn't do it. It said that it takes twice as long for a self builder to build a house to compare with a professional builder, but it took them something like four times as long. That was two and a half years of, of hard graft. 
When I first came on, it was it was uh, just black guys. It was black guys, I think it might have been a couple of women, who seemed to like the kind of physical aspect of the work. I won't mostly work with the women. We could just get on with really well. So there's about four women here, and I used to work with them all the time. I used to really enjoy that. It was Andrea, it was Kathy, it was Lorraine and myself. If it wasn't for the women that were involved, the scheme may not have worked. It may have split apart. Yeah, I'd say I've learned a lot. I mean, things that I wouldn't have been able to do if I hadn't been on this scheme. I won't actually appreciate it till I've moved in and I can just look around and say, oh, yeah, I've done this. Did you experience before? None whatsoever. So you came here? A novice. Yeah. When we um, first of all joined it, there was nothing around supporting the group, around conflict management. I suppose anybody that's done this sort of thing before might have some expectation that some team support might be required. When I was paying chair of the housing committee at Lewisham, I already knew that the Downham estate, there were some difficulties. Uh, a lot of the families at the top of our housing list on grounds of need came from Afro-Caribbean background, some has an African background. We were finding that people who were offered houses on the Downham Estate were actually turning down these offers. Clearly, they felt it was a hostile environment. The fact is, when they went to visit, they could already see the, the curtains twitching in the, in the houses round about, and people saying, who are these people who are coming to live here? We had to cut through all that. We had to challenge it. It wasn't necessarily articulated, but it was definitely there. This was an NF area, and they made it clear that they didn't want us here. One day, I was on the site on my own, and two guys came on, and they, one had a, a can of petrol, another had a chain. And I pretended there were other people on the site, so I just shouted out, and I called the police, and I walked directly towards them to challenge them, like we were, and we were gonna go for a fight. Fortunately, he turned around and walked away, and then I followed them off the site. It only became more important that we did our own security. Hey. No, no. This is, this is spooky. I could almost see the actual moon. One person had to stay every night to do security. And it was a very unpleasant job because there was no lighting on the site at that time at all. And you were in really old, mouldy caravan. It's my yard in the, in the night time. And I remember the first night being here, you, you're apprehensive all night. I don't think you even slept properly. We actually decided to did double up in the actual security. And me and Errol, we would do that on a Thursday, I think it was. I tell you, it's really getting, it's really cold tonight. Just about a few minutes ago, the wind was actually blowing the caravan. Well, it's nice doing it as a pair, actually. Mm. You don't have to sort of, like, be on your own, just thinking C18 or NF's going to come and mm, right. burn the place down. You you feel a bit more in control. We used to sleep in the, in the knowledge that if they throw a petrol bomb against this caravan, we won't get out. If you hear something, you feel much more confident that you can go and check it out. The site is haunted. Well, I'm going to pray about that. <laughs> <laughs> it seemed like it was funny, but it wasn't funny to me. I think in, I was trying to be the brave one. That it draws things out of you that may not have come out of you, that go beyond sort of pride, to actually survival. I came down one morning and I could smell burning. And as I got about halfway down, they said, um, number whatever, 12, I think it was, has been burnt down. And I walked down and saw the horror of it all. I lost a whole house, and then half of this house and half of number 11 as well was gone. Burnt for seven hours, and the frame was still there, solid. It took some professionals with chainsaws to get it down. I remember at one stage, um, my son's mum said to me she wasn't sure she wanted him to stay here because of what what was going on and what was, you know. Some people just left immediately, said, what kind of area is this, you know, and things like that. Knocked the living daylights out of the co-op. And maybe we never did recover, I think, in a, in a way. Some of us wondered whether we'd ever finish or whether we'd want to even be here or be able to stay here. Some of that 
could have been predicted. If you, if you plonk an all black cellboard in the middle of an NF area, what do you think is going to happen? <laughs> There's going to be some bad stuff happen. My parents moved in before I was born, in 2003, I believe. The first time my friends came around was in year five, a little birthday party. But even before they came in, they just saw the house thinking, wow, it's completely unique. Where else did you get, like, a road like this? It's kind of rare, this open community. Dolly lives in about the middle of the road, and, uh... A couple of times, she's made a curry for every single house and just knocked on the door and give us a fresh curry, which is like, you know, where does that happen? The neighbours are well like family. The support they showed me and Mikhail, you know, it's like you don't even get this from your family. Unfortunately, there's been a failure in the long-term maintenance of the houses. Their approach was to kind of blame the self-builds for that. It's far easier for them to scapegoat the visible minorities than to deal with what the working class deserve and should have. I have no doubt about what the original agreements were, that that share would be in perpetuity with self-builders. That's the agreement that was made with them. If the one thing we could change in London or anywhere is to have strong communities and people come together to get things done, there's a power in that. There's an enormous power in that, you know. What it really means to me is community, especially for the boys, the hard work and, and graft. They, they lived it. They've seen how hard we've worked. Kieran, Kieran, look around. The thing that makes me happiest is that my neighbours in the street, we, we greet each other and people are participants in the process of creation of a great community. The people had actually managed to recreate something that was deep down in their, their soul, really, as to how things should be. because it was an example of something which defied a lot of the limiting beliefs about uh, black people that were around at the time. It came about near the end of the build and we had to decide what name we wanted. We had been reminded of our blackness in some not very nice ways. So there were two contingents. There was there was the defiant contingent that wanted to call it Black Man Way and, and stuff like that. And then there was another contingent that wanted to call it the Oaklands. We were determined that we weren't going to be called Oaky Pines or something. So Nubia Way was hit on as a sort of compromise. It was coded for the stupid people who wouldn't understand what it meant, but those in the know would, would get it. I think Desmond Tutu says about Ubuntu, that I and we, we're greater together. Because we're not only creating a community, but we ourselves are growing through that process of the, the challenges of the group and so on. You've got something beautiful that was built out of a lot of ugliness that was around. Our stories are part of Nubia Way, it's not just the building. Not just the buildings, it's um, UV was the whole thing. <laughs>